Long dreamed of a treatment that could regrow myelin, the fatty sheath of nerve fibers, and it might be here. Today, I'll explain Pipe 307, a putative remyelinating drug that could treat diseases like multiple sclerosis. I'll show you cell culture data, animal studies, and even early human clinical trials. On the right of your screen are oligodendrocytes, the cells that form myelin in the central nervous system. And like all cells, they come from stem cells cells, which form oligodendrocyte precursor cells, which then through complicated signaling differentiate into adult oligodendrocytes, which form myelin. And they can remyelinate after injury, and that's part of the reason people with MS sometimes make prodigious recovery, but it doesn't always work perfectly, and this appears to be part of the pathogenesis of MS and why some people acquire disabilities over time. In this famous study by legendary neuropathologist Dr. Bruce Trapp, he looked at people with advanced progressive multiple sclerosis and on autopsy within the multiple sclerosis plaques, oligodendrocyte precursor cells were abundant. However, they did not differentiate into mature oligodendrocytes and form myelin and no one knows why. One theory is there's something about the local milieu of the multiple sclerosis plaques that prevents this and even in 2002 when this article was published, people dreamed of how they might activate these cells. Many years later, Dr. Jonah Chan, pictured to the left, discovered clomastine. He's a researcher at University of California, San Francisco, and he designed an ingenious screen of existing FDA-approved drugs to see if, by chance, some of them could have remyelinating activity, and he found clomastine and other similar drugs. Now, this is an old, cheap, generic antihistamine drug, kind of similar to Benadryl. It's not really used anymore to treat allergies. We just have better, less sedating drugs, but it is available, trade name Tavist. It was patented in 1960, so it's very old, and it turns out its remyelinating effect has nothing to do with its effect on the histamine receptor. Rather, its effect on the muscarinic receptor is what's causing the remyelinating effect, and other similar drugs like benztropine also has a more modest effect. I first saw Dr. Chan give a presentation about this research in 2013, 11 years ago, and even then he fantasized about improving this drug, making it more potent, more selective, have less side effects. And sure enough, as you'll see in a moment, that has come to fruition. But in the interim, more research was done on clomastine. This is a study in animals, an experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, a rat model of multiple sclerosis. Rats were either given vehicle, i.e. placebo, the black dots, or clomastine in red, on the left is the EAE score, a clinical score. A higher score means more disability. And you can see rats receiving clomastine were less disabled on average, though it was not a huge effect. Here is an example of staining for myelin in autopsy of these rats. So this is a myelin stain. Myelin will look fluorescent green. On the left is a naive, in other words, totally healthy rat. You can see there's abundant myelin. In the middle is a rat that underwent experimental autoimmune encephalopathy myelitis and received the placebo. You can see it's mostly black, very little myelin. And on the right, a rat who received clomastine, there's more myelin, maybe not as much as the healthy rat, but a big difference relative to placebo. The research continued in humans. This is the REBUILD trial. Principal investigator Dr. Ari Green, also at University of California, San Francisco. I remember talking to him at a conference many years ago, and he was very cautious, reminding people that this is an unproven treatment. They studied a fairly high dose of clomastine, 5.36 milligrams twice daily. The problem is taking that morning dose could be quite sedating and could be very unpleasant. It was a short trial, only 150 days, only 50 people. So it's really hard to demonstrate clinical benefits. They had a crossover design, meaning if you originally got randomized to the placebo, you later got the treatment. They weren't able to demonstrate any real benefits, but they studied function of the optic nerve. This study was done in people with optic neuritis, injury to the optic nerve due to multiple sclerosis, and they studied an electrophysiologic test called visual evoked potentials, and they were able to demonstrate information through the optic nerve could transmit faster by 1.7 milliseconds in the affected eye. So it did something electrophysiologically in humans with MS. Does it actually have any real proven clinical benefits? This, to this day, remains 
unknown. And perhaps continuing on the clomastine path isn't the right idea. It seems to have a modest effect in preliminary studies, and it has unpleasant side effects, and so they developed something new. And so for the remainder of this presentation, I'll focus on this publication talking about Pipe 307, a novel remyelinating agent. And two of the authors are, in fact, Dr. Green and Dr. Chan. And it has several advantages over clomastine. First, it's highly selective. It only targets the M1 receptor. It isn't an antihistamine and shouldn't be sedating. And they found out that the M1 muscarinic receptor, rather than other muscarinic receptors, seems to be important in remyelination. It's orally bioavailable meaning that it's readily absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract, can be taken as a pill, and it's brain penetrant. It gets into the central nervous system, and they did various assays to see if it can have other off-target interactions with different receptors, and it seems to have relatively few of these effects, so it could have relatively few side effects aside from side effects related to the M1 muscarinic receptor. This is an assay looking at the effect of pipe 307 against different muscarinic receptors, M1, 2, 3, and 4. You can see as the concentration increases, M1 becomes quickly saturated, but there's no effect at the other muscarinic receptors. And these are very low concentrations, nanomolar concentrations. So even at minimal amounts, pipe 307 is a potent M1 antagonist. I believe I said agonist earlier, but it's an antagonist. It blocks the receptor. They did some other studies just to prove the importance of the M1 M1 receptor within oligodendrocytes. This is a fluorescent stain of oligodendrocytes in rat brain, in this case rat hippocampus. And you can see the stain for the M1 receptor shows abundant fluorescence showing that it is within these cells. It's also in the oligodendrocyte precursor cells and it's particularly abundant within active lesions. You can see in people without MS and in inactive MS lesions, the OPCs with the M1 receptor are there, but they shoot up in active lesions, suggesting that may be where a lot of the remyelination is taking place within active multiple sclerosis plaques. So there's damage, but also regeneration. Now we move to the actual effect of pipe 307. This is cell culture, oligodendrocyte precursor cells grown in a media, either the vehicle or placebo on the left and pipe 307 on the right. And you can see the fluorescent staining of the oligodendrocytes shows that with pipe 307, there's different differentiation into mature oligodendrocytes with extensive cellular processes. Here is a study on brain slices, not in a live organism, using the drug lysolecithin. This is a drug which can induce demyelination. So on the left is the vehicle or placebo. These slices did not receive lysolecithin. You can see in the myelin basic protein stain, there's abundant myelin fluorescent green. They also did a stain on Casper. This targets the nodes of Ranvier, the natural gaps between myelin segment, and you can see these well-formed nodes of Ranvier. In the middle is the brain slice treated with lysolecithin. You can see there's a loss of myelin. It appears much darker, and there's essentially complete destruction and scattering of Casper because there are really no well-formed nodes of Ranvier. On the right is the brain slice treated with lysolecithin, but also given the drug pipe 307, and there's more preservation of the myelin and the nodes of Ranvier. It's not normal, but it's much closer than the brain slice without the drug. They also showed benefits in human brain slices. These are just brain slices, obviously not from living humans, and they looked at vehicle placebo versus clomastine versus pipe 307, and they're looking at the concentration of oligodendrocytes, and you can see it was the least with the placebo, an intermediate amount with clomastine, and the most with pipe 307, suggesting that pipe 307 is in fact more potent and maybe in advance on the older drug clomastine in terms of its remyelinating effect. What about in actual living animals? This is a study on mog yei This is a form of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis where they give the rats this protein MOG, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, which incites the immune system to attack myelin. And there's the vehicle, the dark circle, or placebo. They have the most disability on top. Those getting lower dose of pipe 307, 3 milligrams per kilogram, had an intermediate amount of disability, and those getting the higher concentration, 
30 milligrams per kilogram had the least disability, though the effect is not huge. On the bottom are rats that were not treated with the MOG protein, so they did not acquire disabilities. So the effect is not massive, but there's a clear statistically significant benefit in animals. And this is an electron micrograph of the optic nerve of these rats. On the left is the placebo, an animal that did not receive the MOG EAE, in other words, normal myelination. In the middle is a rat that received placebo. They had MOG EAE, they had the demyelinating event, but did not receive pipe 307. You can see there are a lot of faint myelinated nerve fibers and some irregular myelination. And then in the rats that were treated with the drug, you can see not all, but most of the nerve fibers had regular myelin formation. But what about humans? Well, they have a completed phase one study. This is a tiny study just with healthy volunteers, so not even people with multiple sclerosis. And they were just looking at the safety of the drug. Some people with MS can be very sensitive to anti-muscarinic receptor blockers. They can actually have cognitive side effects. But they found that at doses that they thought were good enough that would be the equivalent dose necessary to achieve 80% saturation of the M1 receptor of the brain, there was no measured negative effect on cognitive function, at least in healthy people, people without MS. What about people with MS? We don't know yet. But we may find out soon. This is the VISTA trial, an actively recruiting trial in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. They're looking for 168 participants. It's going to be one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one randomization two different doses of pipe 307, dose A and dose B. It doesn't say what the doses are on the clinicaltrials.gov website and placebo for a 30-week study. So you have a two and three chance to get at least one dose of the drug. The outcomes are the MS functional composite, the low contrast letter acuity, a measure of visual function, time 25 foot walk, how fast you can walk 25 feet, the nine hole peg test, a measure of upper extremity function, and the symbol digit modalities test, a measure of cognitive function along with MRI scans and blood neurofilament light chain, a marker of central nervous system damage, and we'll see what the results show. And I gotta say, I'm excited. This is really neat. Now, some of these things don't pan out. Not everything that works in animals works in humans, and the effect in the EAE study wasn't that large, so I wouldn't expect this would lead to a total reversal of all disability in everyone with MS or anything like that. That's not a reasonable expectation. But this could be somewhat effective, and any even modestly effective remyelinating agent, if the drug itself would be welcome news to the community of people with multiple sclerosis, of course. Another thing I want to point out is this is a greatly abbreviated presentation. You can read the full article in the notes below. There's a ton of research, a ton of time and effort and sacrifice that went into this. So full credit to the researchers, including the many that I did not mention, and I'd be interested to know if you've tried clomastine or if you'd be interested in participating in this clinical trial and if you have suggestions for other videos.